Okay. What's happening, everybody? Thanks so much for stopping by. Another edition of Tackle Shop Live. And um, we got a great show tonight. We've been, we've been inspired. We've been yes. inspired. We've been hanging with George all week long, and he's been, like, glued to the telephone, watching the Major League Fishing, which was a spawn fest, you know. Yeah. Really cool deal going on there. And uh, so we thought, well, let's talk about spawn fishing, the, the, the spawn, not like pre-spawn, not like post-spawn, but right on the spawn. And it's very difficult in Northeast, especially around where we're from. But um, we're going to try to give you some tips and hints and things that we do and break it down like we always do here at the Tackle Shop. Um. So that's coming up here in just a few minutes. Thank you, everybody, for stopping by. We got Bear Minix st stopping in. Johnny Cop, how are you, buddy? Keith Howard, James Hawk, Devin, how are you, Devin? Tanner, how you doing, Tanner? Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, Mark from uh, Lisa Lake uh, Fishing Club, good to see you, Mark. Um, so thanks, guys, for stopping in. If you have any questions on this also while we're going along here, just um, – comment and i'll try to keep up with some questions but we love the questions from you guys this is interactive this is live active you know jump on board ask the questions and hopefully we have answers for you so um definitely do that randy egger how are you randy good to see you buddy <laughs> carl carl how are you carl um so yeah good to see everybody here um i got a couple announcements we're going to start with and um one is uh our sft tournament is on as we've been saying now for the last several weeks. And um, it's. Uh, at day break and um, you can buy in now for, for, for the people who don't understand our, our tournament, it's a buy in style format. So that means we are we, the tournament sponsored by Shimano, G Loomis, Jackal, Power Pro. Those companies, those four companies right there are, are sponsoring the event. So you have to buy in with their products in our shop or, or online or online or online through your shop, through our shop. You can't yeah. go somewhere else and show me a receipt to something else because that don't work. This is our our tournament. You got to do it through us. Uh, but it's really cool because everybody gets to win in this event. It's a buy your tackle Go fish a tournament, and if you don't catch nothing, and you and you weigh in, and you're like, "Oh man, this sucks." Guess what? All that stuff you 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 bought is a winning a winner. Anything? Yeah. Huh? Anything? Yeah. Not nothing. Anything. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. I appreciate that. I'm working on my my uh, grammar. Grammar, yeah. So uh, yeah. appreciate that, George. Double negative. Just for, ask Randy Egger in front of. Uh, <laughs> 6,000 people. Thanks a lot. Uh, and so, anyway, um, so it's a really great tournament. I know a lot of guys on here fished it before. Randy Egger fished it. I know that. Uh, a bunch of guys on here well, we um, usually, participated we in it We usually get in the range of 100 boats. Uh, of course, last year we didn't fish it due to, um, yeah, you know, the flu. But uh, the year before that, we had over a hundred boats. Yeah, we always, we, we we get a great yep. and and this year we're upping our payout by two thousand dollars more on the payout. So you know this year we're probably going to get like three hundred and fifty boats. Yeah, <laughs> I mean you know, so I mean anybody get there early because parking's going to be at a premium. Yeah, I mean anybody that buys a rod, real or anything over. The buy-in at SFT during that month auto automatically register and yeah, well, take your boat and go down. Here's yeah. the deal with this tournament. This yeah. this tournament started many many years ago as a concept that Mike and I had. Yeah, many years ago, and we did it. Uh, like long level here. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it was kind of like a sort of a buy-in but also some entry fee because it was a small you know yeah. we, humble beginnings humble but yeah, gotta start somewhere other companies uh liked it and 
the guys at Shimano were the first ones to step up to the plate and say, hey, this is a great concept. Now, if you look at what has happened to this concept, this is being done all over the country now. Yeah, you're right. They yeah. have this. They have the same exact tournament on uh, at at Thomas several Hill. of their yeah. biggest retailers around the country. Yeah, and it's done on this on this purpose. They're, yeah. they're even doing We're one famous. now. We're famous. Well, they're even doing one now, guys. That started last year from our good friends down at Anglers in Annapolis. A snakehead. Oh yeah. Bought, uh, buy-in Shimano buy-in bu- Shimano buy-in tournament. Yeah. Whoa. So the, the cool th- buy-in and why we keep saying the word buy-in other than the fact that it's a buy-in is it's your entry fee. It's your entry yeah. fee. So it's your entry fee. You know, instead of paying money for your entry fee and not getting anything and for going it, out and fishing unless, and, you're, unless you, know, you win, not cashing a check or, but if you're like me, cashing a check, well, if you're or like, even cashing a check or even winning, yeah, right. You still get the stuff. Now you get, the same as if you paid an entry fee, but you also get to keep your tackle. So yeah, it's, right. it's not that complicated of a concept here. Yeah, it's great. But it's great. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yep. We this is the first time that we have done it in May. This is uh, the earliest we've ever done. We last year was the first week in June. Went over great. We and we right. have some really cool swag bags for yeah. you guys. Or matter of fact, I can't wait till the <laughs> tournament. Because the freaking warehouse back here is packed with <laughs> massive boxes of swag that Shimano has well shipped out here for you guys. So well, you know, whatever we can gather that's up, we exciting. bring we bring down there for you guys. We do a toss. Yeah, you know, we you know, so it's a lot of fun. It's really for anybody. It's a, it's if you were ever thinking about um fishing a tournament, this is a perfect time to do it because literally everybody's a winner. Yeah. And um you get, you know, you're going to get some good gear, and it's, uh, we, you know, we, we love working with Shimano, and it's going to be at a prime uh, time. It's 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 yeah. at a prime time. Everybody's going to catch fish. It's going to be it's, huge. It's going to be a really good way in. Huge. Hopefully, the weather, uh, as it always does, uh, you know, um, cooperates. cooperates with us. Yeah. So, you know, we we only had one time where it was kind of questionable, but you know, it was all good. Yeah. So, um, anyway, that's enough with that. We, uh, April 23rd is when it starts. Buy in. The buy-in starts uh, April 23rd. You're going to be able to download your application from our website or come into the shop here, fill out, fill it out completely, get your buy-in done, and then we'll we'll take care of it from there. We'll get everybody registered, and and yeah. uh, we'll go from there. So, yes, and we will talk. Of course, as we get closer to the tournament, we will talk about the specifics of the operation term. Yep. We have an army of help there, so it's very yep. smoothly run tournament. Yep, yep. Jason. And Shay's in the house. What up, Shay? Shay's like on number like 15 days straight in a row with guiding. Maybe more. He's a beast. He yeah. is a beast. He's catching all kinds of fish, too. <laughs> Logan, how you doing, Logan? Dan Swagger. Richie Hall's in the house. How are you, Richie? Good good to see you, brother. Um, yeah, Richie. Good to hear from yeah, you, man. D- Dan Sand- uh, Sanders, how you doing? Uh, Brian Moffat, how you doing, Brian? Always stopping in. Always checking us out. I appreciate it, pal. Uh, Justin Bean and um, uh, so great guys. Thanks for stopping in here. Uh, fantasy fishing. We had our uh, fantasy fishing last uh, week on the Sabine River. Um, oh yeah. So uh, thank you guys for getting in on that. Uh, we have a tackle pack for the winter this 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 month or this week, uh, and the next one starts next week. So make sure you go to Susquehanna Fishing Tackle on F- Bassmaster Fantasy Fishing. Enter. And uh, for a chance to win some cool prizes next week, they're um, at Lake Fork. And next week, they're at Lake Fork. So that's gonna, they're gonna need f- fork lifts to carry their bags to the scale. I hear it's fishing pretty good. They're gonna be like, yeah, motorized vehicles to get the fish from the boat. To it's the pretty scale. cool. It's pretty cool. They're only allowed to weigh one fish in, though, and it has to be an over. What's that mean? Who knew? So fork is a managed oh, a slot, a slot. trophy fish. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So that if you catch an over, yeah, which is 24 inches, I want to say. Yeah. So if you catch one over 24 inches, you can bring it in, bring it up for a weigh in. Okay. But you could also have like 31 pounds without an over. Sure. You know, not bring anything in. You could also have, I'm all right with that. No. Yeah. You could also have like, you could also legally weigh a limit in on that lake that weighs less than six pounds. Yeah. That's like, crazy. With like the unders. Under. Yeah. 
Or so yeah, you might not want to do that. So last uh, Lee Lo- Lee Lively Livesley will be throwing swim yeah. baits better than those fish. <laughs> so um, last <laughs> tournament on a Sabine, uh, I'm gonna say it, uh, M Cox, because you have a nickname that's pretty weird. Wiggle fart, really? <laughs> M Cox, you won it. Thirteen fifty was was the points. Ray five seven seven two B Ray. Uh, was second with 1280. Field was 1244. Uh, Jay Palmer, 1232. And uh, Filippini is 1232. Was a tie for the last place. Mm. So that's, that's all good. Um, so after four events, New Jersey Bass and K. Howell, how you doing, brother? Uh, 4636. Um, Zabilski is in second with 4618. So it's a tight race. And D Camp Field uh is 4567. J uh Matera is um 4453. And um V Sarah Boone is 4432. Lake Fork next week. Get in for that. That's uh that's what's happening there. I throw my other paper away. You throwing stuff, boy. Throwing there, stuff. You there you go. There you go. So the other thing I have announcement for is you uh, some announcements. The Conowingo Bass Tournament Series that that me and George got behind. Um, we're doing a thousand uh, dollar match at the end of the year for a championship tournament. So um, not only whatever they keep uh, for the championship, uh, the tournament keeps for a championship. We're matching whatever they up to a thousand dollars. So it could be a two thousand dollar bonus payout on that. Uh, and and I was talking to Brian uh, about ways to pay it out, and he's thinking about doing a, a five through whatever until the money runs out, uh, pay back a hundred bucks. So everybody gets their on a championship. Everybody gets their entry fee back. So um, oh, that'd be cool. You know, you, you can you could come in like twentieth place and get your get your get your money back. I'm all about the big splash. Yeah. Well, I was too. You know, I was kind of like saying, you know, when you win. You win. Yeah, it's a championship tournament. It's not set in stone, but it was just an idea. So that's what we're throwing out there. But anyway, um, that's important stuff because the, the um, you know just ask Ricky Bobby. The the uh, schedule is out now. So here's the schedule. It's in the shop here. We're gonna put this on the on our website eventually. Hopefully, the next over the next week, we're gonna have this on there. The first tournament starts six twenty seven. So it's the end of June. So we got some time here to promote it. Well, they have a Facebook page. It's, where you can get that schedule too. Yeah, if you flip it over here, they have nothing to tell you where to go. Yeah. You know, and that 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 whole paperwork needs a little work. <laughs> tighten that up a little bit, boys. Brian, tighten it up. You might want to put your Facebook page on there. Yeah. Just saying. Tighten it up, Brian. I'm telling you, this is these guys did it last year. It's very nice. Nick, and they everybody loved it. It's very nice. It was a great tournament circuit. Back in the day, nineties. Yeah. You remember Hogmasters. Hogmasters tournament trail. Dude, it was like everybody and anybody who but, was around here that was like a hammer dog yeah. was in that tournament. Oh, it was fun. It was fun. It was fun. Now, listen, I was talking with uh, a good customer of ours today. We're bringing it back right here, bro. I was talking with a good customer yeah. of ours today from Richmond. Yeah. And they have a little tournament trail down there similar to this that yeah. they call the Hog Fight. Ah. And he Ooh. said, you know, he fishes. Um, yeah, well, he fishes. F- I don't mind fighting. No, yeah, <laughs> but this guy said, his, I've been, been no throwing around. The point a bit. of his thing was, you know, he says, well, <laughs> down here we fish uh, the Bass Nation. Yeah, and we fish the the the, the Virginia uh, Top Seventy, which is on the river. And he said, the the hog fight is like more fun than both of them. Yeah, and. They better, but so oh, my my point is is all over the country. Yeah, you you you, you and you talk to guys that are ordering stuff yeah. all the time. All over the country, yeah. there's these little circuits. circuits that have hammer dogs in them. I'll no, that, that my point oh, that I'm oh, trying to make is oh, that has. I just um, dumbfounded them. No, <laughs> um, 
That's, the people that run them yeah. are really passionate about putting oh, yeah. out a good product yeah. and thereby drawing all the all the good local talent that likes that body of water. So, you know, you get a chance to get a great tournament in, run by a great crew, fish for some good money, have some friendly competition, and, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. Paul, yeah. It's Paul all Batter's fish. Paul's fishing it. Um, there's guys fishing it, and, and it's going to be fun, and I'm going to jump in a couple of them uh, to fish a couple, as many as I can. I think they're all on Sundays, I believe. Yeah. I think, I think so. So, you know, I might, I'm going to jump in a couple of them. I'm telling you right now, I'm coming at you. Uh oh, coming at you tough. Haven't fished there for like three years, but come at me, bro. Yeah, coming at you, Mahatango. Right. So <laughs> that's a good story. I'm gonna tell that story sometime. Not tonight, but once not before. tonight. All right. So tonight, it's all Matt, about, Matt tonight, Elliott. It's all about the Batula Negras. Uh, Matt Elliott, we're doing fine. Thanks, buddy. And uh, Copy, you got to get in that tournament because I really want to kick your ass, Brian Kraut. <laughs> <laughs> they call him Bubsy. Bubsy the crowd. So, Bubsy. Mike, let's jump into some tournament talk while we're talking tournaments. Well, let's, 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 uh, so check it out. Check it out now. That's the, uh, Conawinga Bass Fishing Open Series sponsored by Susquehanna Fishing Tackle. Check it out. And now we're going to jump into some, as we always do, tournament, tournament talk. talk. Um, Yeah, so this is our section of tournament talk, and boy, did we ever have some tournament talk. We got some talk. I'm telling you, that was a major league fishing yeah. deal, and, I, and I'm not a big fan of it, but that was cool. I, I'm not sure what the tournament was called. I don't know if it was, <laughs> a, it was the heavy hitters. It was called the heavy hitters. I don't know if it managed. I just don't know I don't if know, it the was dude, the... The dude who won it won 100000 Oh, yeah. So it was serious, well, and, actually, and Big Fish was 100000 Well, Big Fish on the last day was 100000 Plus, the winner was 100000 Big Fish. The day before was fifty thousand, and they gave a lot and, of shit ton of money. And, and big fish in the qualifying rounds was twenty five thousand. That's why they call it the heavy hitters, Mike. And now the <laughs> way you get into the heavy hitters, and here's kind of like I knew why they called here, it heavy hitters. You didn't know it. Why. Well, no, actually, the reason they call it heavy hitters is to qualify for the tournament. Got to weigh they, more than one hundred and ninety pounds. They take your biggest <laughs> fish. No, 240. From every <laughs> tournament of the year. So, you know. Good qualify. One fish from each tournament, because, you know, it's all catch, weigh, and release. They take your biggest fish from each tournament. They add them together to form a five-fish limit. Yeah. So, you know, they're, 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 that's, to me, that's kind of a, a push at the five-fish limit uh, uh, circuits. So you you qualify by being in the top forty of the five fish limits from the year, and then those are the people who get the fish heavy hitters. And heavy hitters pays out five hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars, and three hundred thousand of that was paid out um, in longer in the last two days of the event. So. It's a very interesting format, but what was interesting about it for us was we fished those lakes. It was held in the Raleigh-Durham area on Jordan Lake, Falls Lake, and Harris Lake. Yeah, and we tell great stories about when we were down there. Yeah. So we fished those lakes. So we're <laughs> Biscuitville. Yeah. So Corbin, McDermott. George, and me went on an excursion down there to fish um, um, Harris. Spur of yeah. the moment, right, spur of the moment yeah. too. And it was spur of the moment, and, and, and it was in December, December the 5th, matter of fact. And uh, we went down there, and of course, it was the coldest day of the year in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. And we had a, we struggled, but we but we fished all those lakes. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Fished them all down there. It was awesome. Yeah. It's right there. It's like the trifecta right there, right, George? Yeah. 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 So they have other nice lakes down there, too. But, uh, you know, more on a tournament was it was a spawning event. Oh, which is damn. what we're talking about tonight. So exactly. it really ties in nice with our program. It was kind of spawned off of that because we were watching Ish set up on a 10 pounder for like three or four hours. And then he finally caught it, hooked it and lost it in 10 seconds. Yeah. And then he fell, no. fell apart. No. What? One second. One second. So he had it like a half a second. I thought he had it longer than that. He had it long enough to lose it. Well, 
He was done. Yeah, fish didn't bite the rest of the day. Neither did this. <laughs> but that was a hundred thousand dollar fish. That was the last day of the tournament. So why not stick? Why not go for it? Hold it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, actually, uh, that, that was a ten pound fish. Jeff Sprague won the championship lunker with a five pound three ounce fish. Oh, so he. So they're on Harris Lake. Yeah. Which is known for forty pound bags, eights, nines, tens, and a five three wins lunker. That's crazy. But. It was a full blown sight fishing event. And it just kind of just got going too. It yeah. Just like got going. When they were there, as a matter of fact, it's 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 probably at its peak right now for wave number one of the spawn. So it kind of segues into what we're doing. The other the other interesting tournament that we had uh this past since we were on last was the conclusion of the Sabine River event. Um, yeah. which was several phases of the spawn, depending on where you went. <laughs> I love that tournament. It was spinnerbaits, man. Depending on where you Chatter went. Chatterbaits, Senkos. Depending on where you went. Yeah, that freaking nutcase was running like. <laughs> two, I mean. You know, Nick, we, you know, we were worried about you running, running to your, that spot we were telling you about. You know, so it was going to be like a little bit of boat ride and yep. getting back. This this dude was running two hundred miles round trip, round trip. No thanks. So out in the ocean with the dolphin. Well, uh, Galveston Bay. <laughs> oh, I hit free Willie. So what was interesting <laughs> about this was Jason Christie, who run the event, went up to the dam at Toledo Bend, which is where the Sabine River comes out of, and Brock Mosley, who finished second, went. The other direction. So basically, yeah. they between them they went two hundred miles in the yeah. opposite direction. It took uh, Chris every day. It took Christy longer to get to his spot. Then he had to run slower. Yeah, he it took him longer to get to his spot than it. Than he was running a nasty, nasty river situation. But apparently, Brock was the only one that made the run. There was other guys over there. A couple, and and one of Brock Mosey's like spots that he fished the first day, second day somebody went into. Go he, figure. He was not happy about it. Wow. But nothing like watching a little live rerun. I mean, 100 miles away and you go to somebody's in somebody's spot. Well, That's I hard. don't know. That 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 may or may not be a fair statement I made, but who knows? Well, you never but know. the cool thing was it was a spawn slash pre-spawn slash post-spawn. And the other thing that you might not understand about that event although it was very exciting, it was the second lowest weight that ever won a four-day event in bass history. So while it, Whoa, seemed, wait a second. while it seemed like these guys were hammering yeah. down and I catching thought, I fish. I thought they were smashing them. Well, I mean, you know. Every time I saw Mike McSellan, he was catching like a five-pounder. Well, I don't think so. Apparently not. <laughs> I don't think so because it was the second lowest weight ever for a four fish to four day, four day derby. Yeah. Did wow. it beat the three rivers? That was a Bassmasters Classic oh. three day. Oh, thank God. Because yeah. I was going to say, if that place, then that yeah. would really suck. Well, I, so, I got to tell you, when we were down there, Corbin, yeah, it does fish stingy. I believe it. Dude, we were there. Especially for, when you get the pressure on it. We were there two days fishing our asses off and. It was tough. We didn't catch a lot. Yeah. It was tough. Of course, it was a. We weren't we weren't sight fishing in December. No, it was an Arctic chill. <laughs> yeah. It was a massive Arctic chill that came So, through. you know, Christy won the elite. Now, he came back from the other tournament we're talking about. Oh, shit. The, the MLF, elite. BPT, heavy hitters, major league fishing, uh, pro tour, whatever it's called. Wait. He was fishing that too? No, no. He was fishing that for the last couple of years. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He came back to bass. Back to bass. Changed his whole mind. Uh, mind. Yeah, I mean, he's running a, a express boat over a ranger because ranger fired everybody um, because Johnny doesn't have enough biscuits to eat. And, <laughs> I mean, he said, <laughs> I got some business to take care of, and now he's got, I think that's his fourth Elite Series win. Yes, yeah, I think it's his sixth BASS win. So I mean, shots fired. Yeah, 
And that was a, a spinner bait. He threw a spinner bait for four days. And it was interesting because the first two days he had to navigate extremely shallow water. The third day, the Toledo Bend Dam decided to empty the lake and his area rose by eight feet. So he was able to just ride. But he was using his Garmin Graph fuel sensor to calculate his best efficient running performance because there's no gas stations going that way. So he had to he had to ring that thing out. Yeah. And then on the on the on the heavy hitters major league fishing bass pro tour five fish limit uh all fish count over two pounds <laughs> except for the last day when all fish count over three pounds tour. Alton Jones won. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Alton Jones won on sight fishing and let me tell you I watched it. Yeah. It was a clinic on yeah. sight fishing. He I was mean, awesome man. He walked us through it. It was it was really freaking cool. You know uh, that tour I only, has. I only saw him catch like two, but it that was tour awesome. has a really lot, a really quality live aspect to it. Mm -hmm. The announcers, the commentators, JT Kenny and Marty Stone, and the guy with the vest, they are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> are. Vest. They are. The guy with the vest. He's got a vest on. Oh man, you can't say not his a name. life jacket. I don't know his name. He's not wearing like a Mustang or something. He's got Corbin. What's you know, his name? I don't know. But usually a nice tweed, <laughs> but I guarantee you, it's not the guy. I don't know with his name. Best. He's wearing a nice tweed herringbone pattern. You know, I, I don't wearing. know what his name is. Oh, Honestly, God. I don't. Well, I, I don't know what it is. I, I mean, he's the guy with the vest. But anyways, <laughs> the guy with the vest, they do an awesome job. I think they. I think they're fantastic. Paul doesn't like uh, Marty got, Stone, obviously. Uh, Paul. Marty Stone's a personal friend of mine. We'll have to talk after school. <laughs> Remember, Paul, back in the day when we when we were like young and we weren't going to school, we used to schedule our after school fights. Yeah, like <laughs> you're going to meet me at three o'clock on Saturday at the rec field, and we're going to settle this. Oh my god! So, Paul, Marty Stone's like three o'clock on Saturday, bro. Marty, we're going to settle Marty this. Marty Stone was like a old school. He's like. Uh, he if he would have if he would have won like a some kind of big tournament, he could have been like. Well, he easy. won Angler of the Year. That's nothing to Wait, sneeze so, at. So, so he can go in the bass as a, as a. Oh. Uh, what, is that a legend uh, you, exemption? Legend exemption. Mike, is that your prediction for twenty twenty two? No, no, he's making way too much money on MLS. Just, just saying. He's he's loving life on MLS. Oh, look at Paul. He wants to. Okay, Paul. Three o'clock. Behind the rudders in Marietta, <laughs> this shit's going down. You can say what you want about me or my dog, but you ain't going to talk about Marty Stone like that. <laughs> that's, that's a good one right yeah. there. Well, I mean, you know, me and Marty are tight. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. And Marty, Marty, Marty always was. Marty loves Pop. Oh, yeah. Marty, Marty and Pop are like, oh, yeah. they're like boys. Yeah, he was a cool yeah. dude, man. We used to hang out with him at all the shows. Yeah. He was just a great guy. And, yeah. and, you know, he's a hardcore guy and really tried to make it. And, you know, it really worked hard to try to make it. And what he did for how many years? I mean, he fished, uh, fished professionally for many years. He had a successful professional career. Yeah, and he, he transitioned into, yeah. I mean, if we're going to do 20, 20 facts about Marty Stone that you never knew, <laughs> he transitioned into uh, Bass Cat Boat uh, Regional Rep. Yeah. For a and, while, and then he went, and then he wanted to spend time with his family, uh, his boys, uh, right. coaching uh, football or baseball. I'm sorry, he became a car salesman. Uh, he did all kinds of things. Yeah, he's uh, yeah, he did know. all kinds of stuff. Whatever it took, you know. And he's just a great guy. And then all of a sudden, no, he got into the heating and air conditioning business. Oh, huh, there you go. There's something else. And uh, you know, he's they they actually, if you read the the, the story. They actually like. They wanted him, and they they just they recruited kept, him. Yeah, they kept digging yeah. and pulling and bringing him in, you know, because they wanted who who the uh, MLF. Oh yeah, M big, MLF. Big yeah, five heavy oh, hitter. Okay, yeah, uh, FLW or whatever. FLW so. tour three pound sledge, last day, duck, yeah. two, two pound every other day. Uh, trail, uh, trail. So I don't know, but they and I think it does a great job. But my point is the the yeah. The the live aspect of that league is fantastic. 
Oh, it is. Yeah. It, no yeah. doubt. Uh, and I think the – You learn a lot. The guys yeah. talk hardcore about – like, like – that's what really spawned this show was was watching those guys. And it was like, you know, it was cool. It was cool to watch. And it was things that we talked about about that. Uh, definitely a, a, a great – that was a great show. I didn't watch a whole lot of it because I was busy. But, I wasn't. but but we watched – you know, George had his phone. He carried it around. He set it on the cash register. <laughs> and he, it's this thing. You know, we'd ring people out. It was just, just talking all in the background. It was, it was just – Excuse Single. me, could you wait to pay for your five hundred dollar rod? <laughs> yeah, Marty uh, Alton talking. Jones is getting ready to set the hook. Yeah, on the it, it was like we'd all stop and like stare at it, and the customers <laughs> and, were like, "Customers are like," and I'm and I'm out work. You know, when we're out working on the floor, he carries like, it on his. I got I got it on my cart if I'm stocking, cart, yeah. and and people are like, "Oh, what are you watching?" And yeah. we're all watching. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, but anyways, yeah, that's kind of what went on, and it kind of motivated the three of us. Although yeah. about a week ago, we were kind of. Come spit on some. What should the next show be? Well, it definitely morphed into this, and, and yeah. that's where we're going to go right now. So let's talk. And we're going to get into the spawn. The spawn. Yeah. So, as um, we said, this is a show about the spawn. Now, we talked last week about pre. We talked the week before about pre. We talked yeah. about this. We talked yeah. about that. But this is, we know fish are on the beds, and we're going to go after them. Right, George? Well, that's part of it. Yeah. The, the problem is, uh, if you're not familiar with sp spring fishing or spawn, spawn fishing, and, and you always have a you, you never have success like you see on TV. Right. That's because it's one of the hardest times of the year to consistently catch fish. It's very, very, very I difficult. I think we uh, we all agree with we all agree with that, Corbin. Trying it's to catch frustrating. these fish. Well, first trying to find yeah. them. You know, it, people think you just look in the water and see these things. Yeah. It's not that damn You just easy. go to a big flat somewhere. Yeah. Oh, look at this big Whoa, cove. Whoa. They're all spawning over <laughs> here. <laughs> There's a cove over there. That's a spawning cove. Let's <laughs> go in it. You know, it's not that damn easy. You it's in, not. You go in there and look around. You don't ever see any spawning fish on beds and stuff. It's, it's really, a needle in a haystack. It's really hard to find them. And, um, you know. And then the timing. The timing. The timing. So yes. let me give you an example of the timing. I I, I recall a, a tournament I, I finished on, on uh, Lake Anna many years ago. And I got on like this wad of big fish. I didn't catch anything under four pounds. And I'm like, man. So I'm on points, Carolina rigging points. Watermelon red. Pretty much. I mean, <laughs> I find these fish late in the day. I tell my co-angler, uh, who was a very well-respected tournament angler back in the day, who was going as a co-angler, I'm like, I I'm sure you heard this all the time from boaters. Fish. So this we're doing, blah, blah, blah. We're Carolina rigging. And what I was Carolina rigging was points, which was pre-spawn. But here's the, here's the moral of the story. I found the fish late in the day. The next morning, we, we got to whacking on them, and we caught all four pounders. And then at like 10 o'clock in the morning, it was over. And it was a series of points. It was like five, six points. So it was a pretty big area. And, you know, it was textbook, five points coming off of a big point with a channel swinging in, blah, blah, blah. You couldn't draw a better picture. So a buddy of mine was fishing. I saw him a little later on because obviously I didn't know it was over at 10. You know, I didn't leave till 2. And he said, man, you should have seen the fish that were cruising up on that bank in the afternoon when I when I fished that shoreline past you. So that's what I mean by the timing of it. So these fish hold up, stage up on these points, and then the moon or the, the, the temperature or whatever, basically, like, not even... Not even a day later, 18 hours later, they left and they went to the bank to start cruising the bank looking for spawning locations. So the timing of actually hitting the spawn is a very fleeting thing. And then and then throw in a 
uh, a cold front, throw in a wind. Yeah, throw. Wind. I mean, it, it just it's it's not as easy as it sounds. No, I I I think it's a very difficult time of the year to really consistently catch fish. So that's kind of what we want to talk about is yeah. actually catching spawning fish. But the hardest yeah. part yeah. is actually finding spawning fish. <laughs> right. So you know, a lot of the a lot of the places we fish here where we're from, um, we're dealing with dirty water. So it's not really. It's not really a, a sight fishing thing. It's more of a knowledge of where you think the fish are going to be spawning. So, you know, we know, we know there's historical spawning coves that, that are historical spots for spawning uh, all, all over the country. So you have those spots. We have them here where we're from. We have, you know, certain coves here, certain coves there, certain, certain uh, creeks here, certain creeks there. And we go in those creeks to look for spawning fish. Now, we're not visually fishing for those spawning fish because you can't see them. No. We're not looking. You, know, you can't see the beds. The water is always dirty. It's always stained. Right, Corbin? Yep. Now, you know, some of the spots that you, some of the stuff that you fish over your way is yeah. clear and it's a little more visual fishing. Yes. So you have that like traditional sight fishing stuff that you can do over there. But I'm telling you, every, all my lakes, everything that I do, it's all... It varies. I mean, some areas are clear, yeah, where you can actually see beds and see fish on beds. Yeah, and, and in our part of the world, yeah, but a lot of them aren't. I'm just saying, can how many times I, you know, that I actually had the, the right kind of conditions that I visually uh, fish for. A lot of the education that I had with spawning fish and understanding the way the fish react to baits on the bed, like they talked about, was in ponds. Yeah. Yeah, it was the greatest place in the world to go and learn about how fish react to baits and the bed and the makeup of the bed and how certain parts are hot. Because when people started talking about that, I, I could go out and do that. And I could see, you know, what that's all about. And so I learned a lot about that. But anyway, um, so for me, you know, one of the things I want to talk about tonight, George, is fishing those spots where you can't see them, but you're just looking for yeah, so, and some of the baits we use for that. And yeah, so I mean... Let's 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 take a scenario of a tidal body of water. Let's take a scenario of a lake. Let's take a scenario of a river. So, you know, I like to really think about a lot of these things are carry the same characteristics, but let's let's look at a large grass, basically grass uh flat type area. Um so you could be on, and and, the, and I'm going to relate this to waters that I fish. So I could be on the Potomac River. I can be on, you know, the famous expansive grass flats of the Potomac River. I could be on the Chesapeake Bay. I can be on the famous, the flats. Um, or down in the Sassafras River on big, giant grass flats that occur down there. Anyways, you, you, you can't really see these fish. Yeah. So, you know you don't really know if they're actually on beds, but you know they're in that area, or you hope so. So I like to start off looking for them with moving baits. But the thing that I've learned over the years is, you know, you need to slow down, okay? Um, now, when, I, when I'm kind of feeling that that the spawn is is really happening on largemouth on these waters is um two or three days on either side of a full moon nighttime temperatures that do not dip into the you know like we're going down into the 30 36 or something tonight or tomorrow night good nick uh, good luck nick, nick this week Thanks. <laughs> well, and and and, Cold front. and yeah. consistent water temperatures that need to be pushing that 60 degree mark. So, you know, in our part of the world, we have spawn times. You know, we'll actually have a wave of fish that will spawn in April. We'll have a couple of waves of fish that will spawn in May. And we ha have a nice wave of fish that spawn in June. Uh, most years. So, you know, 
you have to arm yourself with the knowledge of what the moon phase is, what those temperatures are. It's really, really important to pay attention to your weather forecast and your water temperatures. Like we have a little, we have a little cold snap coming in here, which is going to back some fish up. Okay. So that's oh. as far as my mindset. Yeah. Right. Weather, weather plays such a huge role in this. Makes the spring so difficult. But once a yeah. fish locks onto the bed, Corbin, What's he what when the cold front comes? Is it it's not he's not going anywhere. She's not yeah, going anywhere. It dep depends. I mean, she's I mean, locked on a bed, she's done. So, yeah. uh, large mouth tend to lock, small mouth may pull off and come Well, she's back not and, gonna be there that yeah. long. I know, I'm just saying. She's not gonna be there that long. Yeah. The whole process is a short, much shorter than we think. I know that, but she's there for a full day and they're kind of working around and stuff. And if a cold front comes in. And uh, she, you know she's working that bet. She's not just taking off unless it's major. They should right. stay in there. I mean, if it's some kind of crazy cold front, you know, right? Like like the ones I agree with you fishing. with what you're with yeah. what you're kind of getting yeah. at. Yeah. So you know, again, in a lot of these areas, you don't really see the fish. I mean, I've had it already. Like uh, where I have had extremely clear water, you know, on, on the rivers that that I like to fish. You know, if you get a big off off current area with grass, that grass will filter that water out. And you know, I've driven into I've driven into these areas already. You know, the night before a tournament, <laughs> and like <laughs> through there, just ding, 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 yep. ding, ding, ding. Mark like twenty. Yeah, feet. and they're all in the bed. And the next morning, they're hey, all gone. gone. So gone. yeah. So that's the frustration level. Well, Mark, Mark, in this scenario, he asked. He asked, uh, "How long do you, you know, how long do you stay on a, 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 a fish?" I think I was Mark. Um, how long do you stay on a fish? Well, you that know, was Ed Proctor. Oh, that was Ed. Ed, uh, you know, so in this situation, you really don't know because you don't even know that the fish are there. You're just kind of working that area back and forth. So, how long would I stay in that area? If I'm if I'm dragging and I'm getting bit, I'm staying there. If I if I know that. There's fish in there in a spawning area that I know that's a spawning area that I figured out it was a it's a bay or a cove or a, or or a, or a you know a set of islands or or a certain thing that I know that's where the fish spawn. I'm gonna stay there for a while. I'm just gonna work it. I mean, you know, you can do a lot worse uh, things than staying in a spot this time of year and working it over and over and over because. You got to realize a lot of these, these these fish don't they don't all go okay. Light up, spawning time. <laughs> you know they're not all rolling in there and spawning at the same time. So you could be working that bank back and forth. The gravel's right, yep. temperatures right, the sun's beating on it right. It's got the good temperature on it. You could be going back and forth on that thing, and and then and then you can fish will just keep moving up. Yeah, I mean, once especially keep moving in there, especially on these large like um, tidal tidal areas where you have these large wow. grass flats. You I have mean, a lot yeah, of you fish. got a lot of water to fish. You have a well, no. Once you find an area that's holding a spawning area, yeah. you have a lot of fish that are moving in and moving out, and that that area is going to be very very productive. It's a big spot. It's going to be a big spot. You know, you got to kind of look around and 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 looking around might be meaning covering, you know, hundreds of acres of water. You know, so I like to look around with a moving bait. But the, the big thing about that is I like to slow down. So I may fish my, like my favorites. My favorites are a chatterbait with a swim, a booted swim bait trailer, um, a swim jig with a boot foot swim bait trailer, and uh, some sort of a, of either a wake bait or or, or very close to or you know, all around that bedding cycle, I find they respond better to a slower retrieve. So, and that, but once I get bit, Corbin, game on, slow down. So, George, take it apart. Right. Does this mean that you go to these slower gear ratio reels, or do you like meaning? I know 
I know we've talked about gear ratio before, and you're big on the sevens. You know, yeah, maybe really, eight here, but I don't you, really change do my, slow my seven equipment down? that way okay. now. Yeah, no, but I do fish a slower reel um, than most people. Here's a great. Here's a great question. because I, I, I when, once I start catching fish, I kind of forget. Yeah, and I start winding real hard. Yep. So that slower reel helps me, but but I think I think Corbin, I think it's so important. Like for example, my swim jig retrieve. Jig retrieve when I'm on these big grass flats, searching, and keep in mind I can't see very much because the water's right. not real clear. But my is slow that I'm I'm swimming, um, and I'm jigging. So it's like it's like a combo. So I swim it along. I swim it along. I feel grass. I let it sink to the bottom, and I kind of work it through that clump, and then I kind of pop it free and swim it a little bit. It's like a swim jig slash jig combo retrieve, right? and it's really effective for getting bit in a big area. And if I get bit a couple times, I'm thinking, wait a minute. I'm no dummy here. This is the you know? pattern. And, yeah. and I'll always drop a waypoint. Exactly. I'll always so, drop a waypoint. I ha always have my map up, and I'll always drop a waypoint. Yep. We got a question here. Uh, is the magic temp for the spawning games, uh, you know, spawning to begin more important in the creeks? Or is it have to do with the main river temp getting to a certain temperature for the fish to, you know, start their gig? You know, in other words, the creeks warm up quicker. So is that going to, is that what dictates the fish starting to spawn? Who's that for? For me or George? Uh, it's just based on tidal. It's a tidal water question. Well, I don't think it's. So in other words, I don't think it's so critical on the actual number of the temperature. I, I think the critical part is what we said earlier. It has to be consistent. Pushing that 60 degree mark, but consistent, not like. Today, it's 60. They're going to spawn. It has to right. be consistent well, and your right. nighttime yeah. temperature. Yeah. Cannot dip. And once right. you get that and then you get on a couple days on either side of that moon. Yeah. Those fish are going to spawn. And one thing know? I one thing whether I, it's on a creek or one thing I noticed with this, you guys, is it can be like George said, you know, it could be 60, but you can have 60 to 70 on one day. Yeah. You know, well, yeah. But as long as you're in that 60, because largemouth. Largemouth like it a little warmer, and they say you know 70, 72 is the trigger. It, it's not. I mean, it's it's you'll have them from sixty to seventy four, and and that you know that's a month. Yeah, there's fish spawning for a month. So I have a I have a a, a little thing that I do to determine water temperature. Is I consistently go by morning temps so if i'm fishing for multiple days within a time frame i want to know what that temperature is in the morning say eight o'clock in the morning whatever um because you're going to get your daytime gains your nighttime losses but that morning ish time of say eight eight o'clock if that's your time that's going to give you a picture of is your is your temperature improving or is your temperature dropping? Yep. Okay. And that's going to tell you a lot combined with weather pattern and moon phase on what you're looking for. You see what I'm saying, Mike? Yeah. Or, I don't go by the gains during the day. Or, uh, or you can just drive around and look for a bunch of big pile of boats in a spot and then you can go in there and fish. <laughs> or turtles. <laughs> I, I like don't turtles. Know about that. I like turtles. <laughs> I well, I that. mean, that's community whole fishing, but that's, the, you know, you'll yeah. see that happening. You know, you'll see guys going to these areas that are typical, uh, are typical spawning areas this time of year. And it just becomes into, into a giant community hole. So, you know, we, we all have that on these bodies of water that we all fish and there, and there is no secrets anymore, you know? Yeah. But that's not how we find our fish. That's not, but I'm just saying, that's not how we do it. Yeah. I'm saying that's what that's what a lot of people do is they go around and they just go into these areas that are oh, look at look at all them boats over there you know or oh look at all them boats over there and we, I used to call it the I used to call it the Potomac uh, uh, 
uh, pattern, you know, the bent carousel, pole, bent pole pattern on, on, uh, on, uh, down the Potomac river, man. You, you just you get two, three boats and, and one guy catches a fish. It's like a magnet, man. It's like all these boats come in, you know, that's not the way you should do it. You know, you should, you should base your facts on what George is saying. And, and what we're talking about here is looking for the warm water, looking for the spawning areas, working the areas, um, I like to search them. I yeah, like to search. I like to cover. Out, I like to cover, cover those big water. expansive areas. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, is, is some days the fish are more aggressive than others. Yep. Some days you can recognize that, and you can stay with that swim jig, or you can stay with that chatter bait, or you can stay with that sh shallow running crankbait all day long. Other days, and most of the time, you know, you need to get into that area, find the fish. Now the couple things that's going on, you, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, bro. I mean, what uh, you're gonna catch, you're gonna catch some aggressive fish that are, are either a buck bass on that moving bait, or you're gonna catch maybe a couple of bigger fish on that, you know, couple of them. But if you really want to catch fish during that spawn, you got to slow down, man. Yeah, that's why I like to search. I like to work my search bait slower. I, but what I like to do is once I find some fish, you flip all the time for spawning fish. Once I find them, that's what I'm saying. Yep, that's what I'm saying. You're you're like like really telling guys about this moving bait thing, and, and it's like you find them with that, but then you got to stop and fish it because these fish have beds, and and they're not gonna they're not interested in eating unless you get on their bed. You have to drag in their bed. The only place I see anything different with that, George, was was in lakes uh, scenario. It was uh, fishing for smallmouth, and we were throwing swim baits just to find the smallmouth. They would come up out of their bed, and they would come up and just nose that bait. And, I mean, it'd be like six feet above them, and they'd come up and just smash it, and they'd go right back down. And then we'd go over and flip a tube on the bed and catch the fish. They didn't want to eat it. They just wanted to right. push it away. But up there, the water's so clear, they would, they would go up. Hit the bait. Just That's a whole different game up there. Well, I'm just saying it's it's a spawning fish, you know. So you know you got to be really careful with your with your moving baits. And I've seen that with guys. I've seen guys get too addicted to moving baits and mm -hmm. catching two and a half, two and a half, a three and a half, and then man, they're like I'm catching fish, and they come back to the scales with 16 pounds. So I mean, if you want to, if you, you want to come back, you come back to the scale with 16 pounds, yeah. and the guys have. 22 24 pounds and you're like what the hell well you fished for two and a half pound fish it depends you didn't design your area it depends if and you, you want to work your area if you want to talk from a tournament's perspective well, yeah, so that's there's how we base everything on is tournament yeah if you want to talk stuff. from a tournament perspective there's two scenarios that come into play here fish moving baits to find fish okay and cover unbelievable amounts of water because you only want five big fish. So you might blow through a huge spawning area that has a ton of fish in it, but you're catching one big fish, and then you just keep on rolling, keep on looking. And you're and that's a that, I, I call that like the numbers game, the odds game. The other is to is to is to fish these search baits and recognize that that area has a lot more fish, and then drop the poles. And change to the next tier of baits. It doesn't take that long to 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 you know do like George says, just get a bite and then stop and throw around and on on you know you got to check the bottom all the time. You have to check the bottom. Yep. You have to fish. You have to stop. You have to check the bottom. If you get bit, it doesn't. I don't care if it's two pounder. You you should stop. Ten minutes. Move on. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Catch a fish. You need to do that until you until you really dial in on. That's fish. the best way. That's the best way to deal with the spawn. I feel. And I think if you catch a big giant fish, you, you know which one you catch. You catch that one that has, it's like this. It's an aggressive fish that does, hasn't even decided to go up and move up yet. You're catching the one that's just kind of coming up there and sniffing around and setting up. And usually that song guns like, like. And a lot of times, giant. a lot of times when you slow down and start fanning that area out. Yeah. Man, you start getting bit. So, yeah. bait wise in that scenario, Corbin. Yes, sir. This is tidal water. Yeah. 
okay? So you have the search baits like George is doing, the yep. swim jig, which we talked about, the swim bait, which we talked about. And then you got to have a f- flipping no, bait. No, the chatter bait. The chatter bait, I'm sorry. And then you got swim a, jig and the chatter bait. Swim jig and, and a, the chatter and a shallow bait. running crank bait. Okay. A shallow run, I got it all wrong. The wake bait can be deadly. And, but now you got to stop fish out area out and drag on the bottom. What are you dragging? Me? Yeah. What are, you, what are you flipping? It depends on how shallow it is. I mean, it could be it could be a Senko. It could be uh, like a beaver style bait. It could be a creature bait. It could be a brush hog. It could be a lizard. What if you had to narrow it down to one? Uh, <laughs> Instead of fishing your whole entire tackle well, box well, on listen, one spot. Listen, I mean, I, I do things a little bit differently. Come on. But I mean, fight it, fight it, bro. Fight I, it. Fight it. I guess I just throw a Senko. No, yeah. fight it. Absolutely. I, I guess I guess I'd Tell just us throw why. a Senko. Tell me why. Tell me I, why you want to throw all these other things. I, I don't. I don't want to. Because for I me, wanna... I fish like I'm. I do things when I when I break down the spawn, but um, I'll talk about that in a little bit here. But I mean, for me, if I was if I if I caught a fish on a chatterbait, okay, fish on a moving bait, and I wanted to, and I was fishing shallow grass, I'm definitely gonna pick that stupid senko up, and I'm gonna throw it around, and I'm gonna throw it around, I'm gonna throw it around, and then I'm gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna keep moving. But yeah. I'm not gonna live and die by it, right? Because I, I know somebody that I used to fish with that is pretty good senko fisherman, and yeah. you know he would just throw it randomly. Well, he'd throw it all day long, and you know how randomly he would just catch a six pounder out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean that's yeah, you, you know that's that's kind of a sign. well, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I, and I think you know his uh, he, his uh, bag show that. Yeah, sometimes he gets lucky and lands on. The mother load, correct. And other times he just catches one here and there. Yep. But you know we're trying to scientifically do this a little bit, a little bit more. And I think that that's a really good, you know. And this is kind of a scenario of tidal water. I think we're talking about. Yep. Well, the deal so. with the Sanko is um, you can fish it a couple different ways in that scenario. Uh, I, I mean, I I have tremendous confidence in it. When I finally find an area that I recognize as holding some fish. And I drop those poles and start picking that area apart. I go with a Texas rigged Sanko first and foremost. And for me, it needs to have about an eighth ounce bullet weight on it. Um, and I'm basically making short to medium range casts. And in my mind, I'm dragging the Sanko through the bed. So I'm, I'm saning out that area. And I'm feeling for the bottom. That's what's so important about that little bit of weight. Um, Because in that grass that you may or may not be able to see, and and as you're spending time there, you're developing a picture with your uh, graph because you're leaving a a breadcrumb trail. You're, 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 You're marking your edges. And what... These fish like to do is they like to spawn on that edge of that grass. You're just just inside of it. A lot of times, if there's a shoreline nearby and there's a and there's a bald spot between the shoreline and the grass, they really like that inside, inside edge. Inside edge, yeah. We've yeah. had some amazing, amazing days day. yep. on inside edges where the trolling motor is up. You, you, we're push pulling. There's no water. The bottom of the skeeter is like. Mm-hmm. Doom, da, doom, da, doom in the boat wake. So, mm-hmm. you know, feel, feel, feel the bottom. And, and I think you said that best. Even when you catch a couple fish on your moving surge baits, you need to feel the bottom. You have to. And I think what you meant by that was for hard spots. Yeah. I mean, you know, the it, spot on the spot. They, they, shells. That sh- well, I mean, a tide water, that's what it's all about. Shells. Shell beds. Well, in lakes still. Yeah. You have the freshwater mussels. Yeah. They get up on the bars. I don't know what they're doing. But it's, the you know, it's the right kind of, it's whatever. It's the right kind of structure. It's that, it's that, it's that hard spot. Hard it's, bottom. That, it's a hard bottom. Um, but, you know, in a lake scenario, in a lake scenario for me, it's, I think it's a lot easier to figure out where they're, they're spawning. You know, I think it's a lot, you know, it, you've got a lake. It's all deep down the middle. Then you got all these arms and coves and stuff going off on it and you know then you got main lake points you got secondary points yep right 
that we all know how to handle that. So we talked about we talked about main link points and secondary points before on the pre spawn. But now now we're beyond that now. See, we're beyond we're in the pockets. We're into the pockets. You know, we're into the actual spawn. So you know, if you were catching them on the on those main lake points and you were catching them on the secondary points, well, the next logical progressing the, that water and making a loop and then making a loop in the next pocket and making a loop over there and making a loop over there and then working your way out and going to the next creek. You know, it's just, um, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I, I had experiences with it at Lake Anna. I've had experiences with it on Lake Champlain. Mm -hmm. I've had experiences with them on my local lakes around here, which our local lakes around here, <laughs> it's pretty funny because it's yeah. like you got this bowl that goes like this and you got one little thing off here and maybe two little short little pockets. You can cover it all in 10 minutes, you know, and they're trolling motor only. And they're trolling motor ever. Yeah. So it takes a little longer, but, but, uh, you know, Raystown Lake, I've, I've, I've extensively fished Raystown Lake, Lake during the spawn, which is a deep mountain lake. And I and I learned a lot about the spawn up there, and that's probably the most sight fishing I've ever did in my life was up there, um, you know. So we and then we learned about depth. So we learned about depths. Then we learned about you know in some of these reservoirs, these mountain reservoirs, they're you know that are clear, they'll spawn in deeper water, seven, eight, nine feet of water. Exactly. Uh, yep. We fished up in um, Lake Champlain. We were we were catching smallmouth in eight. 15 feet oh yeah and they were flugging them they were flugging them floggering 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 Flug i think it's flugal <laughs> they were flugering you're we flugging with the uh with, with the cone in the water you know you're kind of going around so you know it, it was sight fishing but it was like in a much deeper depth and those fish were the big fish i mean those five and six pound smallmouth were literally in tw in 15 foot of water spawning they were huge it was unbelievable wow, huge so you know the you, 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 you have that kind of knowledge you have to understand about spawning. Then you have your local lake water where, you know, you're, they're spawning in you know, two to six feet. And then you have tidal water fish that, that spawn in one to, yeah. you know, one, depending on the tide, it could, it could be one foot of water, but it's one to six feet of water. They're shallow, super shallow all well, the time. You know, and, yeah. and back before marinas, that back, kind of yeah, thing. Back before we had all these options, you know, back before we had endless choices of, of techniques. Yeah. When we were ham and egging it. Yeah. You know, it was simple. I Drag fished a, Carolina a ton. Of, rig. <laughs> I fished. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I fished a ton. How many? Of a ton. So what was your search bait? Rattle trap. Trap was my search bait. Yep. And, and what, then when I got into an area, and now, I didn't have any power poles now. No, no. What did you I don't have any spot lock now, but I have been known to anchor. Yeah. And I got out the old ball and chain. Ball and chain, man. That's a great, great bait to and use. And I would be slinging a three-quarter ounce lead bullet weight with yep. a three-foot leader. And guess what I was dragging, Mike? The number one all-time greatest spawn bait Six ever. Six-inch Zoom centipede. Lizard. Thank you. Six-inch Zoom Lizard. Yeah. James Hawk got it. Zoom Lizard all day long. Absolutely. Who said that? James Hawk. Yes. George. Yes. Dan Swagger. Yes. Uh, who else? Yes. Somebody must have said that. Up so here somewhere. we fished exclusively with the lizard. And to this day, during the spawn, we throw the yeah. lizard. Don't Carolina rig it as much as we used to. Now, but we do fish it on a Texas rig. Here's a question for you. Chime in. During the spawn, Texas rigged pegged or Texas rigged not pegged? Don't ask me. What, what, what do you got? Uh, I peg all the time. Never, yeah. never do I not yeah. unpeg. Yeah, that's an expected from you, Nick. I just, that's just the way I and am. It, and this is exactly what I expect from Nick. Yeah. I, I never peg a Senko only because when that weight falls down for me, that Senko, it's almost like a Carolina rig. For yeah. Me. And that's, that's just the way I do yeah. it. Yeah. I knew that was coming from you, Corbin. Both. Both okay, and both. Mike, Mike, you probably knew that was coming. From Not me. only does he do both, but he uses nine different kinds of pegs depending on the situation. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Listen, listen. Do you, do you want to know why I do both during this? Yes, spot? I would. Okay, explain because, yourself, young man. Because first of all, depending on the body of water, depending on how close you were able to get to the fish without spooking them. Okay, 
you want to, I always want to use the lightest weight possible during the spawn. Okay. So if, for instance, it may be a one eighth ounce weight. Okay. If I'm throwing a one eighth ounce weight on, let's just say uh, a tube or something like that. And I flip out, throw it as far. Okay. Or if I'm fl fishing in grass, sometimes that weight gets hung up. So then there's times where I'm fishing a little bit thicker cover where I want to peg that weight. And right. I'm, and I, and if I'm going to peg it, Okay, I may go to a little bit heavier weight so that I can get through the cover and leave it on the bed. Did we uh, we, did, we, did we bring any pegs up here with us? I don't think no, so. I use the six cents. Uh, I'm gonna grab. I'm gonna grab a pack of pegs. Yeah, and I want to show everybody how we put the peg on. Yeah, and I want to show one little thing about the peg that I think is really important. Yeah, and this is a little bitty deal, but I think it's big. So. Talk amongst yourself. Talk amongst yourself. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, I, I, I probably, I, it makes sense to me to not peg in most scenarios, you know, especially in my gravel scenario where I'm not dealing with grass. I'm definitely not pegging. I like that when it, like Nick said, it hits the ground, Nick, and then the, here comes the lizard or the here comes the yep. whatever behind there. And you know what? You probably don't even throw a lizard, do you, Nick? No, but getting back to the peg or not peg, the reason why I don't peg and I, I really like that free fall yeah. is because in the bodies of water we're fishing anymore, there's so much pressure, and it's that realistic presentation to me is just sometimes a difference maker between a bite or not getting a Sure, bite, you know? absolutely, absolutely. So I want to – And that's and, – and Corbin, and isn't, isn't that what you're saying? I want to challenge everybody at home. This is a challenge. Uh oh. I want you to take a one eighth ounce Texas rig and peg it. Okay. And then I want you to take that same bait on that same line, put a quarter ounce bullet weight on it and unpeg it and talk to me about the fall rate. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally okay. different. So that's what I'm saying. Like I want that lightest fall and depending on what you're like, let's say you're using a, a bait, like, you know, a rage crawl. Okay. That one eighth ounce pegged is going to fall like this. Yeah. Okay. That quarter ounce unpegged is going to fall like this. A quarter ounce pegged is going to fall like this. It's a big difference. So for me, again, keep in mind, if you need to really back off of these fish because of pressure, that's why I use both. I, I mean, I, I, I totally get that. I, I really do. Um, you know, I, I guess the pegging thing also can morphs into, um, you know, where these guys are drop shotting for, for spawning fish, you know, yep. where they're separating the weight from the bait because they want the bait to be above and hovering over the fish, you know. So that's that's really gotten big in the last couple of years. So, um, you know, anybody who thinks drop shotting is just a deep water technique or whatever, it's a great spawning technique. It's something that um, kind of, I guess it, 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 it intimidates the fish on a different level. So, you know, it, it, it uh, is different than what a lot of people are doing, you know, when they're flipping and dragging on the bottom, it's, it's, it's different. Um, so it's something you really got to think about and there's a lots of really cool things. So, you know, um, there's power shotting, which is, you know, a heavy, uh, drop shot with a short leader, like a six inch leader with a wacky rigged or a Texas rig, whatever that you're just flipping the same way you would flip in clumps for, you know, you're, 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 you're just seeing a clump, you're flipping to it, seeing a clump flip to it. And your bed's going to be right around the clumps the same way that they would be, you know, they're, they're using something that they want to be around. So they're going to put a bed right off of pad seat. stems, pad stems, that kind of thing. You're just wood. Going, you're just going along and you're flipping in where you think a bed may be and it's just a different presentation i know george had success with a with a power shot uh, in a tournament where it, it, was, it just wasn't happening and, and the bite changed and he went to this power shot and boom 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 three fish in the boat because he was fishing a pressured area everybody's dragging the bottom yeah i think you just get the bait up off the bottom a little bottom. bit you know and it's it's amazing <laughs> or if you're in a, a an area and you work it pretty thoroughly yeah of you being there yeah tames that bite down a little bit i think it's I that's think it's, when it's time to yeah now 
you know, a lot of times in those scenarios, using a spinning rod with light line. No, I'm saying power shot. Yeah. So power, power shot to me is power shot. So the big thing 20 is, pound freaking line or big braid, 15 or, to 20, you know, big old heavy line and, and big old heavy hook. But you know, that's right. Yeah. Big the, old heavy hook. You got to have the right hook, baby. You don't want to be flipping no uh, power shot with a thin so, wire hook because you'll be disappointed very quickly. Let me put you on a scenario here before we get into this pagan thing. You're you're gonna power shot with a you know a short leader drop shot on a, on a stick, seven two medium heavy. Let's say you got twenty pound fluoro, twenty pound fluoro. Seven let's two medium say, heavy. Let's say that you are seven to one gear ratio. Let's say that you're gonna wacky rig your sanko. Wacky rig in a sanko. Now using, let's say there's you cover your, uh, the cover in the O-ring? form of wood and docks. Yeah. What hook are you going to use? Because yeah. if you go with a regular wacky rig hook, uh, I would like to bring up an experience I had at a BFL a couple of years ago. I got my feelings hurt pretty bad. Five pounder after five pounder. I mean, I'm, I'm throwing a three Oh, uh, extra wide gap EWG, um, Super line hooks. But the problem with that is, is your hook is wide open, exposed, and you're flipping into boat pilings and trees. I know. And getting snagged and destroying Not your area. Not all the time. Okay. Not all the time. But well, I, am, I, am, I am getting hung up, though. Let me tell you something. I, I was very frustrated that day. Because they didn't I, have these hooks when I was doing I that. did exactly what you just yeah, said. Yeah, but they didn't have these hooks then. And I got hung up. They didn't have these hooks They then. did. No, they didn't. But they didn't have them heavy enough. this heavy. Right. And let me tell you, that's a brand new hook for this year. Well, a couple years. The uh, the, the the these Nico hooks with the yeah. weed guards, right, are absolutely perfect, perfect for power shotting with a wacky Sanko yeah. or a or a wacky worm. And I'll tell you, you're not bending this Gamagatsu hook, and you're you're damn sure not bending this Titan uh, Mustad. Back back in the day, you didn't have that. No, man. you had you had. Uh, but uh, starting a couple years ago, we did. It just, yeah. I, so let me tell you something else, Mike. I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, what two years now? Yeah, they got all crazy on this Tokyo rig. Tokyo rig. That's, so basically, that's kind of what this. That's kind of another setup for that. Yeah, I can't get this freaking hook out of this package, dude. dude you did this before, and and. It didn't work. It didn't work. So the Tokyo rig. Don't do it. Can you get the Tokyo rig out? Tokyo rig comes right out. The Tokyo rig and the and the the new Gamagatsu Geica rig. Here we go. So these rigs right here are like a little short version of the power shot. But what's cool about them is on the VMC Tokyo rig is that you can. Um, who, who is the person that puts all these stickers and stuff on this stuff? That's uh, for the presentation. Good God. I ain't never going to get that. back. Well, I just bought me a pack of Nico rig hooks. So I'm never going to get that back in there. No, that's never getting back. There in it there. is right here. This is a cool setup right here in the Nico. No, that's a Tokyo. I mean, Tokyo. I mean, I'm sorry. Remember those names? You guys, if you were following the show, you know how I am about these friggin' names. I hate them. Too many of them. So what's cool about this right here is this can be your short little drop shot. And all you do is put whatever weight on here and bend this up with your pliers. Nick, did you ever fish one of them yet? No. So you you know this and and now you're now look Nick you're off the bottom that much. There's the Geica, and yeah. and this ain't Geico. This ain't Geico. Not Geico. This is Geico. So uh, Fletcher Shyrock is a huge fan of this thing right here. Same same thing here, Mike. Fletcher Shyrock. This is so 
you're putting way. any weight you want on there. Any weight you want, right here. And we're gonna put. Uh, well, we can actually interchange our weights here because you could they, buy, buy they, a couple different. Well, weights. yeah, they sell the Geico rig. Got this Gamagatsu product, and they sell it. You know, two hooks in a pack. Like this is a four o quarter ounce. Okay. So there's, you know, 3 0 eighth ounce or 5 0, whatever in the pack. Yeah. And you can change them out. And the weights are stamped on the on the little weight. Corbin, do you, do you ever do these? Uh, what's this? What's this? Tokyo rigging? Tokyo. Yeah, once or twice, but I, I mean, not, not a lot. So what's cool about that, Nick, is when you're in this pressure, tough bite, uh, situation that we're discussing here you know we talked about power shotting okay so now we have our our little power shot that we're going to make up or we have a tokyo rig or we have a geica rig um option now if you geica rig if why, why the hell would you do that it's a tokyo rig well, maybe they meant to say geisha rig i'm not sure Oh, no, I saw geishas in real life. So I was there. The other thing you can do on that power shot technique, which is deadly around these spawning fish, is you can Texas rig your bait, which is what you're going to do on these other rigs. But if you're, again, if you're pitching and flipping on a heavier rig, you better make sure you get enough hook. Okay. So generally, your standard hook will also come in either a super line or a heavy duty. This is the Hayabusa heavy duty wide get or a uh, offset, offset round, shank round, round bend, bend. Round bend. Which is a which is a tough little dude. Okay. Kick ass. So have yourself a couple packs of those hooks with you. Now why we're doing all this is because we found this big wad of spawning fish and we slowed down on them. Okay. But we talk. You're gonna peg something. We talk to peg or not to peg. To peg or not to peg. So I would love that is the question. I would exactly. love to take. I got. I have some. Uh, I have a. I have a tungsten weight here, and I have. Some, Are you using uh, Corbin? What what pegs do you use? Six cents. George. Doesn't matter. No, because they're. I think they all come out of the same. And if I'm using anything under three quarters of an ounce, I use the peg it. Yeah, well, the original. Please put the <laughs> brakes on that because that's a whole different conversation. Yes, that's what I use. I, I look, I'm so happy for you, and, I like and, it. and so are the people at Top Brass. Why? Why yeah. don't you use a toothpick? Huh? All right. So <laughs> Everybody uses barber stops. Let's and get back I, on know, point. I let's like get the back on other point. one for you know. Well, we're going to talk about that at, at, at another juncture because I have pros and cons to that. But let's so okay. What are we getting asked all the time, Mike? How do you put on one of them stupid things? And ha and do you peg or not peg? Yeah. And we're in the in a riveting conversation Rivet. right now on pegging, not pegging, and and we have four people here. We're we're just about ready to bust out with weaponry. <laughs> I would like to <laughs> offer a um Sort of a go between a peace offering. So let's first talk about the pegging. So basically, you have the little bobber stopper, and he's on a little piece of wire with a little loop at the end. Okay. Cause you would not believe all you people that know how to do this who are now yawning, you would not believe how many people ask us on a daily basis how to do this. And they look at us like, as we're describing it. So this would be a good, this is, this is a good cutout here because yeah, we're going to put our line through here and then we're going to ease that bobber stopper. And, and you see my lines doubled over there, but through the magic of television. Okay. Now we pulled it through and now on our line is right, Mike. Yeah, and, and, and what's left over is a wire. As the wires going, the wires is there, but the bobber stop slid off. That's of a it. once and done deal. Can't see it, and but there's a wire there. Now Bill Lowen figured out how to reuse them. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> we were like, I, 
he won two tournaments ago, Bill? I don't think he's reusing them anymore. <laughs> you are now authorized to not reuse your bobber stops. Yeah, that was a great article. I really enjoyed yeah, it. But yeah, okay, we're not. Who else that. was talking about that? Somebody else was talking about saving this stuff. I think, oh, I know who it was. Our own Greg De Palma. Well, oh. GDP. Well, so now we're going to put our bullet weight on. Okay. I didn't know he was that tight. You with me? Uh, we good? All right, let's tie our hook on real quick. Where's my hook? Oh, hell. There's a geek. Here we go. Lost the hook. Yeah, I don't want to tie that on, Corbin, because you're on top of a geek rig. Uh, I mean, Jed, I like Peg Bundy too. Okay, here we go. Me and Jed Steiner are all set up on that. Tie my hook on here. <laughs> Toothpicks for pegging are not a good idea because you smash the line against the wall of the of the the sinker, and it's harder than you know. So it's pretty hard, and it and it and it has that it has that um, ability to when the sinker slides up, it does slide on a hook set or whatever. It can nick your line and, and create some problems. So oh, I got your number on that boy. The toothpick. Uh, well, there's people are talking about this, so that's oh, why, we're going to talk about that. You know, the toothpick is is better than than some other things, but you know, you do have a little more abrasion with with wood than you do with the the, the pegot, the mm -hmm. rubber pegot. Keep telling yourself. That. And the nice thing about the rubber pegot is it has a slot cut in it, so when you finish, the line goes in a slot, and it's so all perfect. this. Was to show you this. That's how I peg it with my bobber stopper. That little bit of space right there. And that gives my bait a free swinging. Yeah. I just, I have, I don't, I don't peg it down tight like that. See how that's tight like that? There's a circum, there's, there's a circum, certain circumstance when I do that. And it has to do with a swim bait, which we'll talk about it at another time. But when I'm flipping or pitching, I always leave that little bit of space in there. That's a that's a sweet little tip right there for okay. you guys. Yep. I, and I'm, you know, I know we kind of you learn something there. Yeah, absolutely. I did. I know I we kind of like micro fixate on these tiny little tidbits, and people are like, ah, "That's that's ridiculous. That's such an insignificant." Well, you know, I beg to differ. And let me tell you how I learned that. One of my most favorite spawn time flipping baits ever is a tube. And I've probably caught more fish on that blue crawl Mismo tube on spawn fish than anything other than maybe a lizard. But I'm talking flipping to a bed. And the cool thing about a tube is, is it'll, it'll, when you bring a tube up and you go in the action to casting, all the water that's in the tube usually gets slung out of it. And when it hits the water, it's got an air bubble captured in it. And when you have it pegged loosely like that, when your sinker hits the bottom, your tube is standing up mm. yep. for, for a moment or two. Yeah. Okay. So I kind of got that habit formed there. And now, whether I'm flipping a beaver-style bait, which is another one of my favorite springtime baits, or if I'm flipping a Sanko uh, or my tube, I want that little bit of space there on my peg. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Mike? I, I thought you were doing it also so that the uh, tungsten hits the head of the the uh, hook there and you get a little bit of rattle. I just, want, just, that, I just want that free... Yep. Yeah, I swinging bait. Yep. I know guys that do that too, Corbin. They put a little space in between and put a bead in there. Well, I, yeah. I don't use the bead, but I do a, yeah. a real little space. They do yeah. a lot of those tungsten beads because the tungsten weights really break the glass beads so sure, easy. Sure, that's exactly right. Yeah, so they do yeah. the tungsten. They call them the. Uh, so it's handy with the. Force beads or it's, whatever. It's really handy with that, but um, it's. Uh, I mean, you know. Thing about it is, you could be pegging, pegging along. You know, it can be not, you know, not pegging along, 
and you're like, shit, I want to peg so you can take a peg it. Yeah. And you can rig a peg it up quick and you can, you can peg, you can peg it for, you can peg yeah. for a while. You can go along pegging. It's like, shit, I don't, this ain't working. Then I can just reach up there with my rip that wires, out. unpeg it and I'm unpegged. And now I can just go ahead and fish unpegged, you know, for a little bit. And that's why I like about pegets. That's a great point. And I, and I use them for that, but they don't work when you get over three quarters of an ounce, you know, because the pegget, doesn't grip the line enough to to keep it where it's supposed to be, so it slides. That's that's well, really honest to God. That's really what, how the bobber stop style pegets peg pegs. I, I don't know why I call pegets the because that's what top the, brass calls the, them. You know, whichever the orig originator of that, of course, of, of pegets, of course. So um, the bobber stop came along because. The one and a half ounce when when punching became big and you know the, the big flipping weights and all these big flipping uh, yeah you know one and a half and then one you know one and a quarter I think it started at one and a quarter then somebody made a one and a half oh yeah and then somebody made a two yeah now they got a two and a half you know now they got a two and a half so you know now you probably got to put two of them damn bobber stops on it two or that, three to hold that damn <laughs> that damn thing in place but, but that's why that's why they came out with that but it was all pegging up for them but well but uh. There's a problem Peg with the Peggot. Well, Peggot came, came. There's a problem. Yeah, but Peggot came along and said, well, we could fix that with the with the Super Peggot. Jumbo. Jumbo Peggot. But, um, and I, I was getting to that. Back in the day when Tungsten was new. Thank you. Tungsten was very uh, rough on the inside edges. And there was a lot of. Could be. It was, it, right. It was a lot of breakoffs, and there was a lot of bad sinkers floating around out there. So they well, they weren't floating. No, <laughs> <laughs> they floating <weren't>. sinkers, <laughs> yeah. oxyboron. But, <laughs> but what, what what happened was they came out with these inserts. Well, the inserts were fine, but they sucked too because they, they fall could, out. Yeah, where but they fall out all the time. Yeah. Well, no, what Pain would happen ass. is your peg it and your insert would slide up your yeah. line. Yeah, and your sinker would be down here. So you know. Once you had a sinker that didn't cut your line within like 30 minutes or 40 minutes, you'd put an X on it. And you cherished it. And then you took, actually, you would cut, if you're a practice fishing, you would cut your line off, take that sinker, put a T on it for tournament, and you'd put that in your box as your tournament weight because it was proven not to. Now, I'll tell you how bad it was. It's, I fished uh, a tournament down on the Potomac with Randy Howell the last day of the tournament. And um, at the end of the tournament, he said to me, fee, but I want two things from you. I want your flipping weight, and I want that top water that that top water buzz jet that you're whacking and fish on. I want that too. And I'm like, oh, cool, dude. So anyway, if he got it out of Stinkhead's mouth, which petrified me at the time, I don't know why. I was afraid to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Well, you saw all the news programs. It was hard. Frankenfish. Yeah. Well, invasive that, species. Yeah. Well, they crawled across uh, land into a, from one pond to another. That scared the shit out of me. Yeah. So I'm sorry. But um, he was so, so like critical about getting that sinker from me. I mean, he was like, Mike, where's that sinker? I'm like, can I have that sinker? And I'm like, yeah, I'll cut off my rod for you. And he's like, is that the one you were fishing all day long? Is that the same one? I said, yeah, that's the one I was fishing all day long. I said, what's the big deal with that? He's like, oh, dude. You get one that doesn't cut your line within, yeah. within like, you know, 30 minutes or a couple hook sets. Yeah. That is gold, dude. Wow. Now, now tungsten's come a long it's, way. They, they're, they're, they're honing the yeah. insides out, and it's not that critical anymore. But the re and, you know, I guess that's the other reason George is saying they went to Bobber Stoss was to quit pinching the line up against the wall and, and with yeah. agates, you know. Was that was the other thing? Was that what you're getting at? That, that that was what I was getting at. Yeah. But I mean, as far as the as far as the quality of the weights, yes, Mike, much much improved. Yeah. Um. So we don't really have as much of that as it's it very. Is it's, it's it's on, on at least the brands we stock. It's it's rare that you get a bad one. Yeah. But you still do. Yeah. And you, and I still recommend if you guys you know you guys are tournament fishermen. You should have tees and you should have non tees in your box mm. at all time. And that comes with a lot of different things. I mean, there's a lot of things that you should have tees with. But in, in this scenario, what we're talking about is you need to have tees on your on your tungsten because that you know it's important. So another interesting aspect of the spawn season 
is, you know, you have multiple waves of fish. Right. So as you get into the later wave or two, like let's so, say wave two, wave three. So high 60s into the 70s. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And you got depending on where you live, that's those days are already over. Yep. But here we're coming into that. Yeah. We still got a so, lot, lot, lot of it to go. You know, we're talking about slowing down to, to our search baits and we're talking mm -hmm. about picking areas of part and, and this is all wonderful information but this next wave a couple of baits that come into play particularly for the search aspect guys Ooh. two of my favorites the wake bait because now your grass is up a little higher mm -hmm. yep uh, and your fish that are spawning on wood where you don't have grass this is great to work over those fish mm -hmm. right and a top water yeah and of course, my favorite is the frog. Um, Mine is not. Yeah. I like the frog. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is a standard, this is a standard size, oops, standard size Spro 60 popping frog, which is your, kind of your go to weaponry. This is the new 70 popping frog. That's right. You heard it here first. The Spro Sweet. 70, first look, USA. Oh, oh. Ding, uh -oh. ding, ding. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, come on. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. The 70s in the house. Brand so, new. There it is. What I like about a frog. Uh, as a search bait is, it's great top water. It's a weedless top water. So yeah, if I'm fishing great grass, idea. you know, boat docks, lay downs. Yep. So those are my search baits. Yep. You know, get a couple bites. Yep. What do we do? We slow down. Slow down. Okay. Uh, so out that those later, that later higher water temperature, you know, the whopper plopper, a buzz bait. I mean, my goodness. We talked about, uh, we read about topwater fishing in, back in the day, you know, back in the Bassmaster magazines. That was cool spawn, and these guys would take Rapalas. Yes, and they would they would fish a floating Rapala. This was a big thing in in, in you know clear bodies in of place water. almost. Huh? It would be in place almost. Yeah, it would be in place. But the, the and the and the article went on to say that the key to fishing uh, a um, Rapala. For bedfish was to put the shadow of the Rapala in the right spot of the bed. I believe it. Huh? That's some it. that's some that's some precision casting right there. Did you ever try to cast one of them damn balsa Rapalas in the well, wood? I'm just saying. They, they always say about the sweet spot, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, you know, and it just I guess you know lizards. Lizards. Everybody knows lizards are badass because bass don't like lizards because they rob ne they're nest robbers basically. Um, but here's something to put, you know, and they have a spot in their bed. that's like the pissed off spot. You know, it, it's like, it's like you get that's the right spot. That fish is going to either nudge it off or it's going to eat it one or the other. And you get, you, that's why you got to keep pitching to the same bed to figure out where they're at. Unless you're up in Lake Champlain, which is the stupidest freaking fish in the world for, for spawning <laughs> fish. You, all you have to do is get within three feet of them and they, and they just eat it. You know, well, that's a small mouth. The small mouth on the yeah. bed is a whole different yeah. animal. Yeah. So anyway, uh, you know, so you know, you're right about that, but there's a top water bait that was, was forever a huge, uh, well, spawning bait. And you know, the other was thing the about that, Mike, Floating you know, that. the other thing about that, a lot of times that thing would, and, and a lot of these top waters, we're will bringing it back. We'll show you the fish. Right, you right. may not even catch them. Right. You know, it's like throwing. That's uh, why Corbin, I said. Where's the bait you want uh, to talk uh, about? The glide bait. Oh, this. It's like throwing the glide bait. You know, so a lot of times we see these guys throwing, you know, a glide bait mm -hmm. during the spawn mm -hmm. as a search bait because they're covering, you know, these, these pros are covering miles of water. And a lot of times this glide bait just shows them the fish. Well, I mean, we talked uh, that's what I said about when, when, when that's the first I ever seen it was up in Champlain. I'm going to go back to Champlain again. I'm right. Sorry. Was you saw the fish. All, all they were doing was just coming up and whacking it just it, because it was there. It was there. It was it, an intrusion. It was an intrusion. So you know? that's kind of the thought process with the, the, the glide. 
That's kind of the thought process with the top water. Yeah. Now they will eat the bait. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times you may catch the buck. Yeah. But that might, all we're doing is, is we're looking to, for an area to slow down. You only have a day. If vast bodies of water, yeah. you need an area that you can slow down in. Right, Mike? Absolutely. So, me a question here. Like if you're, and I know some guys ask this, if you're at a tidal water, this two part question kind of, Tidal water, how long are you staying in an area that you think they're spawning? Because you can't see them. Right. So how long are you staying there? And if you do see some bass locked down in any body of water, how long are you fishing that bass until you move on? Well, the thing about the tidal, the tidal water that's a little more unique is these grass flats are pretty large, and a massive amount of fish spawn in one area. Um, so I might be there all day and just go round. Your way through, it's you know, I'm looking at, I'm looking at my sonar. Absolutely. And I'm looking, I, I, I like to, I like to have my sonar on and I like to, I like to zig out until I get a clean bottom. And then I like to cut back in until I mark my grass. And, and, and what I'm doing is I'm painting a picture in my mind. Now, with the 360, I can kind of see where that's going. But I still have to have that 2D sonar. And then I split my screen, and I have my, my chart on, and I'm leaving my little trail. And I zoom all the way into 50 feet. And now I, now I have developed this layout of this spawning area that might contain a couple hundred fish. Right. Okay. And that's your best case scenario, but there's been many, many, many times that I've been on spawning areas, either actually fish spawning or getting ready to, or finishing up and just catching a fire out of Cor the fish. Uh, one thing that I have a question here, Corbin is, yeah. um, your main, like when you're dragging on the bottom, your main couple baits that you that you're that you throw in. For me, yeah, you, you brought some along with you. I like to discuss yeah, those baits. I, yeah, I was actually going to talk about it. Well, I do things a little bit different during the spawn, but um, because I'm always looking for pre and post the same time while the spawn's going on, to, so that you know kind of where the majority of the fish are at. Bluegills or something that's that's got a light fall rate, mm -hmm. so. I mean, it's really tough to beat. If you're dragging a bait, it's tough to beat like a baby brush hog or a lizard. Um, and yeah. you can, you can obviously you can flip that, you can swim it, you can drag it. Um, but like my search baits are a little bit different because in the Northeast, we have a lot of bluegills. And so I'm going to go with a chatter bait with a green pumpkin profile, maybe a little bit of chartreuse in it. And I mean, I'm, I haven't fished the goat yet this year. Well, I fished it, but not during the spawn. But something like this, yeah, I used to throw an Ultra Vibe Speed Crawl a lot on the back, and it's very similar. Same here with a little boot foot. But I'm going to a smaller profile, again, covering water, hitting every clump that I can, hitting every single piece of wood that I can, covering as much water as I can until I find a couple active fish. And then once I find a couple active fish, then I'm going to slow down. Um, but, I mean, again, for me, I don't – like if I if I say I'm going and I'm fishing the spawn, I'm not locking into just bed fishing all day. I mean, I'm gonna be doing I'm still gonna check my pre-spawn. I'm still gonna check some immediate post-spawn things and I'm gonna cover as much water as you can because like George says, it's one day and it's gone. So um, you know, and, and fish are in different waves. So Oh, absolutely. That's that we didn't even touch on that. And yeah. I don't think we should because that's a whole other conversation. When do yeah. you when do you when do you leave in? When are you gonna when 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 is post spawn the right time to go post spawn? You know, so that's a, that's another conversation. Oh, but, we're gonna have a post spawn show. Yeah, yep. absolutely. That that's good stuff. Because I love and, the and post spawn. So, and then obviously I'm gonna be throwing a Senko as well. Um, a little crawl lizard. Um, I mean I can I can talk about a little kind of sneaky bait, I guess you'd say. Uh what do you got there? Don't uh, just don't just tease us with something. Bang stick. Huh? The Z-Man bank stick. Um, I, I fished this last year, 
and it was it was excellent because for those of you guys that wacky rig a lot, all right, you know one of the biggest problems is O ring, no O ring, uh, things getting cut in half, etc. Going through a pile of baits. Well, when you take and you wacky rig this Z man, you can skip it. Okay, do whatever. You're going to go through a lot less baits, and Z man actually makes a weight that I put in here, and you can adjust it. And when it sits down and it flutters down on a bed, it sits like this. And then when you pull it up, it, it's like a it's, it's a Z man version of an of a Nico rig. But uh, it's been very successful and caught some very, really big fish, and the fish don't see it a lot. So, yeah. So one one um, one area we didn't really talk about much, and that that is uh, you know river fishing. You know, for us in the Northeast, we fish a lot of the Susquehanna River, and that's a totally different beast for spawning fish because you have a lot of different scenarios that when you're when you're dealing with cur current current uh, rivers that are partly from um, you know, the different levels, high water, low water, you know, yep. something that's going to change a lot. It, it, it really affects the spawn on those rivers. So, you yeah. know, um, guys are always asking me, oh man, where do you fish? You know, and I, and the obvious spots, spots are the creeks, the certain creeks There's certain spawning creeks up and down a, a river, but there's certain creeks up and down a, a river that, that, uh, can promote um great spawning areas so you know those are those are kind of easy to know which ones they are in your area they're usually bigger but they're not huge they're just a bigger creek that has a that has um deeper water a little deeper water in it but goes up yeah. in a little bit you know so you have yeah. some protection from some stuff but you do need a little bit deeper water um so i mean that's kind of like the gimme to river fishing is the creeks what's not the gimme is the off you know the main river structure and that's where you really got to be a knowledgeable fisherman uh river fisherman to really know what you're looking at and how you're looking at it because you know a lot of your islands that these you know for us on our area we we fish a lot of uh you know man uh uh, uh not uh, uh, visual islands. i call them hard islands which are the ones with the trees on them and then there's uh, root-based islands, which are, you know, uh, vegetation that in the summertime is lush and you see these water willow, yeah, you know, water willow, uh, you know, it has a stalk on it. And, and then over the winter, the stalk is the only thing left. And in the, and in the spring and the root and yeah, you know, yeah, it's a stalk and the root. That's what they make power pro from is the root of the <laughs> water willow tree. It's, it's, they're, they're unbelievable. I mean, <laughs> it really funny. is. So, you know, a person who, and this all goes to what, you know, you know, fishing stuff that nobody else is fishing it's great this time of year because it's really hard to read the water to see and find these root balls that hold the fish behind them you know and there's a certain amount of fish that spawn on those uh and use that for spawning as you well know corbin and yeah. again it's a short it's a short it's pretty uh, short turn, a short turnaround well it's a short turnaround for some fish but you know one area will hold fish for a couple of weeks because it's a popular spot and fish will come in into those little bot, those little and, beds, and those areas well, are the most affected by, yeah, elevation yeah. change. And the problem with yeah. that is, you know, if you're if you've got a good season for spawning on the main river, mine river, it stays, it stays consistent for a long period of time. The level stays consistent for a long period of time. It doesn't fluctuate a whole lot. So you, you so then you have a really good main river spawn. Yes, if it's a high river, a high volume year, and there's a lot of volume going down your river then you really got to look for the really protected areas. And a lot of that is the hard island pockets, hard island backs up backs of big hard islands. That's yeah. where they really will set up. And the, and the smaller offshore, hard to find uh, root balls don't really produce because there's just too much volume of water on them. So, and they're um, not easy to fish. They're not no. easy to fish. It's the, none nope. of it. And that's why control is and that's, brutal. And, that, and that's why I like fishing it because you know, it, it's, it's it not only is it hard to fish, but it's hard as hell to read it. Yeah, you know, because you know you're looking for a certain certain current break and understanding where that ball is. So it's not everybody can do that, and and you really got to be on your A game to fish that. And I love that. I love that challenge yeah. going out there. It's re, it's it's you're not going to catch like hundreds of fish. The ones you do, they're going to be hammers, and they're going to be unmolested. And when you drop in the, in in there properly, you catch it, Corbin. Yeah, absolutely, you catch it. And and if you fish wrong, you break off. 
yeah 500 I mean, jig heads well I mean, that's, you, you, it, it's the difference between yeah, unless I mean, you're fishing it, an sft weedless tube head even still you're going to break some off i mean yeah, it's, it's, it's a fine it's, line between being 500 to one <laughs> well we know. developed a whole jig we developed a whole jig head just to fish that kind of stuff we did yeah. that's what was pretty cool but it's very difficult to do it's very difficult to fish it it's very difficult to read the water i know so i know a lot of spot susquehanna river you know where we're from yeah. and you know everybody has their own river but on my river i know spots like the back of my hand literally like the back of my hand and on certain water levels it's still hard for me very to see difficult it. it's really yeah. hard to see it you really gotta you really gotta take your time but i'm telling you you hit that spot you hit that little sweet spot corbin oh yeah it's a four pounder yeah yeah every freaking time yeah i mean it's unreal you know when they're when they're locked in and, and you can bounce around from you know 30 different spots 40 different spots you're going to catch 40 fish on a good day one off each one of those spots sometimes two if it's a good one you'll catch multiple but the yeah. problem that i that, that i'm going to i'm going to tell you guys and, and and it's funny because i just saw something on mike mike mcsellen uh actually spoke on it today in, in, a, in a video when you pull up on a spot georgia fish spawning fish it's smart for you if you you know if if you're not you know not a bunch of crowded it's smart for you just to sit there for a few minutes give it a couple minutes calm down yeah calm down 10 minutes just sit there yeah sharpen your hooks rig your shit up because these fish what happens to shallow fish is they get nervous as hell and they won't bite they just won't do anything but if you're quiet and you just sit there power pole down you sandwich, Nick. So, Mike. I know you bring sandwiches with you. The power pole? Yeah. Uh, what, one, of the, one of the features that I really like about my power pole is I can set the speed at which the poles deploy. Yeah. So, if I go to my master helm switch and they have a little speed-looking dial yeah. button there, you, every time you press it, you'll see the lights get slower and slower. Yeah. When you get to that slowest setting. Yeah. That's the stealth mode. And when I get into them shallow areas, yeah. and, and you know me, I'm a push pull well, guy. You can, you can yeah. pick it up and set it down, pick it up and set it down. But it, 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 when you're on that stealth mode, Mike, yeah. and you hit that slow, when, when the poles hit the water, there's Doesn't no splash. A, there's, no, there's not that whoosh. It just, yeah. it just stealths very, very, down in very there. Important. But of course, all of our electronics are on sleep. Yep. yep. And the funny thing, yeah, the funny thing, transducers there, are turned off. Yeah, and and I've seen this many, many times. You know, you know, on my on my guiding that I've done, one of these areas that are two, three foot of water, and and we'll set our power poles, and chill. We'll, we'll just chill. We'll you know we'll throw around a little bit, and 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 I'll tell them guys, listen, you're not going to catch anything. Have a coffee. We need twenty minutes. I said, just throw over here, throw over there, but don't throw over there. We need we need. And it wasn't 20 10 it was it, but it was a good 10 solid 10 and, then all, yep. and then all of a sudden and then they just they just all of a sudden that fish just get okay and then now you can really see what a fish is all about when he's calm yeah so it's very important to take your time if you know an it's area it's all about it if you know an area just stop take your time yeah, and here's some other things for you scratch to think your about. head slamming slamming hatch lids in your boat not Holla. good yeah. spot lock trolling motor you know, not, uh, good. not good. Super slow on the power not pole. Good. Carry a push pole. Yeah, you these know? are all good. Good. Not, good not electronics tidbits. ticking. Put your put your put your electronics on sleep, or, I mean, they don't have to be on sleep, but you have to turn your sonar. Uh, turn turn your transducers off is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Stealth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Do you ever hear them? The they sound like a train. It's like. <laughs> what are you trying to say? Turn the transistor off. I had no idea. What I, I couldn't think of the words. I had no idea. So you know, stealth mode. Yeah. But this is only after you found them. Well, yeah, and, and we right. talked about how to find them, and we talked about the baits, and we talked about this, and I, and I, I think we're going. Oh, so there's another hundred layers to this onion. There is. But oh, this yeah. is how. We do it. Yeah. Yeah. And we didn't even, yeah, we didn't. This is how we do it. Small mouth on the well, we just did. No, oh, no, I mean, like, tubes and, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, 
like I said, Corbin, you could yeah. go all night oh, yeah. long. You could, stuff. you could. You know that. And we yeah, have a couple absolutely. other things. We're running up on the clock. We have a couple. Yep. We have a couple little yeah, pipe. I, we have some pipeline items. Yeah. You can absolutely. show them. You can show them the Susquehanna tube yeah, killer. We'll save that one for another time. Can you swing out over there real quick and show them the Susquehanna we'll tube killer? All right. You want to save it or you want to show it? Well, I'm just saying, you know, you know, for me on the Susquehanna, we we kind of developed this color. It wasn't something we invented, but it's the color that we really only throw for the spawn. And I don't know why it works. And it works unbelievable. And for all you guys out there who haven't thrown it yet, you need to be throwing this during the spawn. I, it, it is over the years for me, I don't know if it's the purple tail or what it is, but over the years for me, get the net, Bobby. Well, that's the same way with that blue crawl. Yeah. Large mouth fishing. Large mouth fishing, yeah. Get the freaking net with that purple tail because I don't know what it is about that thing, but they they eat it. So, yeah, I mean we can go on and on with this. We're we're gonna we're gonna kind of stop there, you know. And and guys who hung on here to the end, I, I think you really gained some really valuable stuff for it right at the very end. Pay attention to that stealth mode, you know. On top of all the stuff you learned about finding fish, you know, working those fish, figuring out exactly what's going on there. And then moving on to the next spot, and then you know, search baits and dragon baits, and when to drag, and the and and the and the drop shot, and the power shot, and the pegging the weight and not pegging the weight. It was all great discussion tonight. Really, really good stuff. It's, uh, it, 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 this good. topic is too broad it's to cover. Lot. We're we're going yeah, we're coming up on two hours in, in this today. time frame. Yep. But I think I think our thing here is is we try to tell you. Like a, for, Every, a formula, a, a, yeah. a formula from the search to the destroy. And I think we did really well with that. Don't you, yes. Corbin? Uh, exceptional. Exceptional. Now we do have a couple things in the pipeline, Mike. Let's talk about some tackle here. Transition though. on. Let's for a talk minute. about some tackle. And, I, and I'm going to make this quick. This is my favorite part of the show because we're all tackle junkies. Yeah, we are. The reason we started a tackle shop 31 years ago is because we bought a lot of tackle. We have a problem. We got a problem. So, so George continues to buy a lot of tackle, and this is some of the new stuff that he just bought to bring. So in the Matt, shop. Matt is uh, Matt is working right now on uh, a couple of projects. He's got a he's just finishing up with a big bite baits project, but he just started building some pages on some of the new spray products. And this is the 70 poppin frog. Now, arguably the greatest frog of all time is yes. the spro poppin frog. Absolutely. The 60. This is the 60. Yeah. And then now this I, is the new 70. Freaking love that thing, man. The 70? The 60. Oh, the 60. A straight cash, homie. And I hate those great big giant hammer dog frogs. Well, those For the size king, fish you catch, king, I understand that. It's King Mac Daddies. If somebody catches fish on them, please tell me. There was a time. I do. You don't catch them on those big so, ones. So okay. you never threw that damn big one, did you? That's yeah. our. Oh, yeah. You like it? Yeah, I love it. What do they call that thing? The, the, king, that's the bronze eye. The, the king, the king the, daddy. The, the bronze king eye pop 70. So coming to an SFT web page near you this week. That's brand new, all hot off the press. Uh, and another item that we just got in. Oh, rod so, rack back here. We like this. Uh oh, here we go. This we, is impressive. We have in the uh, the series of rods, the new series of rods from Cashin, called the Icon series. Um, S and similar handle. Well, it's the next generation of the Cashin with the yellow handle there. Yeah. We got them right behind you there. Uh, but you're not making anymore? Well, it's being phased out. So the, yeah. the I don't know what they call it, the CR, no, not the CRT, whatever that yellow handle Cashin rod's called. OG. We call that the yellow handle. Yeah. <laughs> you see that one with the yellow handle over there? That's called the yellow handle. But that that was the kind of the, the Cashin that put Cashin on the map. Yeah. And now they have made their rods a little lighter. They've made their, in my opinion, their powers perfect, a little truer. Perfect. Their tapers are a little 
more tapered. Love it. All made in the USA. Still, oh, still have the carbon handle. Virginia, I believe. No, North Carolina, but you're close. Oh, you got to drive through Virginia to get to North Carolina, Bobby. All right, Bobby. Icon Worm and Jig Series here as a sampler. I will and, tell uh, you, you everybody, like. everybody who is uh, think, a Nick? cashing fisherman, you'll notice right away the weight difference. It's 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 a lot lighter, isn't it's it? It's balanced. It's a really light rod. It's nice. It's balanced really the nice. Price, the price is the same. It's balanced, wow. unbelievable. The yeah. tape, like George said, the tapers, the quality. It's just all built right there. It's a cool looking rod. And I think everybody's going to be super happy with it. So Matt's working on those web pages right yep. now. We have the uh, pretty much the whole series of stock. Uh, we just got in a big shipment from, well, including the 70. We just got in a big Spro Gamagatsu shipment. The new DD... Little John 45 has been a hot little number here. That's an awesome crankbait. Yeah, it's a 45-millimeter was... body that dives 10 feet. Yeah. And uh, Corbin and I were fishing a couple weeks ago, and we were doing a little product testing. Yeah. At least yeah. that's what the IRS is going to say. Yeah, it was legit, man. <laughs> well, I tell you. Uh... But, Mike, that was a nice crankbait. Oh, yeah. So they're in the house. Reorder. This is the reorders in the house. So Matt's working on that page. Matt, Matt's busy right now. Busy. Um, and then last but not least on the pipeline is the new Altegra. We talked. We, I think we talked about that did. a little bit last we week. We did, but there, we just got a resupply. We got a resupply of the new Altegra. And uh, Matt's working on getting that page done. So the last thing we wanted to touch on tonight, guys, was Project Panoptics. Yep, which is our our journey into the world of forward imaging electronics. Well, Live. You, you know what they say. You Pro know why you had to get pan optics this year? No, because you can't live life looking in the rear view mirror. For decided, as you all know, we're on Project Pan Optics. We decided that uh, last year we did some three hundred and sixty. This year we were going to do more three hundred and sixty and pan optics. And our, our, our road's been a little bumpy, mm -hmm. um, yep. but we are adjusting. We, well, we learned, we learned a valuable lesson about power. We learned a valuable lesson about power. We also learned it when they tell you on your Garmin unit to orientate your compass. <laughs> what they should tell you is do not orientate your compass because your shit's going to get all messed up. <laughs> okay. So... We are moving forward with yeah. that. We are we're, yeah. we're, 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 we're what we see so far. Yeah. We're 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 probably in the uh, sixty percent range on knowledge. Okay, I think it's a little it's fifty percent. Well, I got ten percent on you every day of the week, bro. Turn it on, press power. There, so <laughs> you know, this weekend we're addressing some power issues. Well, this weekend we're, 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 we're addressing some transducer angle issues. We're going to make it work or it's getting unbolted and dropping into the Susquehanna river. She gone. Oh boy. So, well, we're going to make it work run. on a higher level. This is the last run out. We're going to make it work at a higher we, level. We, 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 we gathered our knowledge. We're learning. We gathered our knowledge for this weekend. We're going to go apply that knowledge. And if that knowledge does not work, going overboard and then and then and then we're also next week we're going to start project skeeter which we're going to bring you guys along on yeah we're bringing the old girl out uh and dressing her up spit shining her getting her all going and so we're a new, putting a new dress on we're new tires we're currently running um a lorant setup on there a three graph lorant side imaging down imaging you know and a couple other little hoopties so now we're going to add into the mix the mega down imaging trolling motor with the Helix 10 and the 360 mega. Yep. yep. And the pan optics. Yep. Uh, Garmin from our good friends at Garmin. They yeah. hooked us up pretty deep with a uh, uh, special Garmin unit. Well, to be run, quite so. frank with we're, everybody, we're, we got a lot of learning uh, to do. Uh, be quite frank with everybody. You know, we, you know, my jet boat has never had electronics on it other than uh, a little four inch five inch uh Lorance, which was a great unit did me well temperature seven inch seven inch temperature did me black and white you know it's all good i didn't really need much because you know how deep is it dip, dip your rod in water oh it's three guides okay we're good <laughs> you know so 
Um, but um, so we upgraded that, and uh, George was going to get a Panoptics, and I'm like, dude, if you're going to get one, I got to get one. Yeah, you can't. Well, be, we want to learn. You can't be one up on me. And, and and the other the other the other thing was we want to learn. So you know, not for my boat for for the jet boat, it, it was more of getting a good good quality graph on there. So I got side imaging now, down imaging, and then and then learn it, and then really learn into Panoptics and see what it's all about. And see why people can't live without it. So, and that's why we call it Project Panoptics. And that's why it's Project Panoptics. But just so you know, George's boat, you know, he had great graphs, but it was it's a little dated. I'm keeping them. Yeah, a little dated. And nothing wrong with them. Let but me tell you something. Nothing wrong with them. He, we fished. Wheeler ain't going to be the only guy with five graphs on his boat. And we, we, fished, uh, we, we fished a lot of tournaments out of that Skeeter boat with, with what we had for years. And it's worked great. It still works great. It's not the, you know, the, and that's what we talked about before about all this new stuff. We, 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 this is the first time in a long time that we've upgraded and, and it's time to do it because there's so much good technology out there and we want to see what it's all about. So, yeah. well, and uh, we're going to keep you, we're going to, we're going to bring yep. you all along on our journey Cor of uh, Project Pan Optics. Yep. Yep. And Project Skeeter. Yep. Corbin's going to be involved with all of this. Corbin's running a uh, right along with us. Corbin's running a hummingbird setup. He's got the 360 and the, Side, side down and all that yeah. good stuff. So, uh, oh, the three in, of us are going to yeah. we're going to continue mm -hmm. to grow with our electronics knowledge. Um, I mean, we had it down to the point where, you know, me and Mike grew up on flashers. For God's sakes, so did David Frith. We grew up on flashers, <laughs> paper graphs. You know, yeah. and I mean, we, we burned. Mike and I burned like rolls, forty cases of paper on our low rants paper graph. I mean, them styluses. We were buying them by the box, and we just burnt. I mean, we had carbon build. Up. It was, so we've been we've been through the transformation, and, and we thought it would be so much fun to learn with you. And we're gonna bring yeah. you along on this journey. And I think one of these shows, we're gonna spend a little bit more time with question and answer on it too. We're gonna so, do live from the water, so, and, and we're gonna do some live from the water, and you're gonna see some stuff, some video from it on our YouTube channel. So make sure you keep in, you know, that. Um, Again, as always, thank you guys for stopping by. Thanks for everything. Uh, like and share, uh, you know, on our Facebook. Go over to YouTube and and uh, and comment over there and and subscribe to our channel, please. We would appreciate it. And um, you know, Nick's always doing all this great work for us. Thanks, Nick, for coming and helping us out and doing what you do. Great, Nick, you're doing a great job. We appreciate it. Um, he's doing all our Instagram. You can check us out at Instagram. What's the called? SFT tackle SFT tackle on our Instagram on the gram. And, uh, you know, so, you know, we got a lot of stuff going on we got a lot more stuff to do. And, but right now we are taking off and thank you so much for, we stopping, out. for stopping by tackle shop live. We'll see you next time. Next time. We gone. Oh, 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 oh,